So we're focusing in, as we said, on um, uh, verses 43 through 48. Uh, before we think about that, maybe you can imagine with me um, a, a, a mountain. This is a high mountain, 15,000 meters high. That's pretty much twice as high as Everest. Um, you need oxygen to climb this mountain and to get to the top of the mountain. It's an unusual mountain for our world. It's got lakes, it's got woods, it's got uh, rivers, streams, waterfalls, all the way to the top. Uh, I hope you can imagine uh, this mountain. And um, it's got a breathtaking view as you go along and as you get to the top. So imagine you've reached 4, 000, uh, 14,500 meters. You're 500 meters from the top. And uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to camp? 500 meters from the top, are you happy? Is that it? Uh, would you leave and go back down without reaching the top? Or would you really want to push on? Would there be something inside you that said, no, I want to get right to the top and see the view? Well, people say that verses 43 through 48 here in Jesus' teaching, uh, Jesus is called the Sermon on the Mountain, and here Jesus is teaching to the people, and, and people say that these verses are, are a bit like the top of the mountain. You're stepping out onto the very peak of the Sermon of the Mount, where we're considering Christian character and what it looks like, and a, a countercultural Christian character and what it looks like. So, as we consider these verses, um, we can ask, well, what are we going to see? Let's, let's push on if we can this last 500 meters and see what the view is. And the first thing that we see as we consider this passage this morning is we see impossible love. We see impossible love. Now, we're going to see as we go along that it's actually, it is possible. <laughs> but before we can see that it is actually possible, we really need to take on board that it is impossible for you and me to love in this way. And we see that impossible love in verse 44. Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. That's impossible love, really, ultimately, for me and for you. Love your enemies. And when Jesus uh, says love, the word he uses for love there, it's not talking about romantic love. He could have used a word that expressed that. He's not talking about family love, the kind of love you have between uh, families. Uh, no, we can define the love that Jesus speaks of here with a statement like this. This love is a commitment to another person's good regardless of how we feel about them or how lovely they are. Ah, a commitment to another person's good regardless of how we feel about them or how lovely they are. So we begin to see that uh, this love, although it does include feelings and emotions in one level, that is not the primary reality or emphasis of this love. Uh, it's about an act of the will primarily. We choose to live for someone else's good. And it's an impossible love. Uh, we can think maybe just a, about one extreme example to begin to see how impossible this love might be. But if you imagine a, a family and either the sister or the daughter has been brutally murdered and then that, those family members are told, love, <laughs> The murderer. <laughs> well, we begin to see the impossibility of it. We begin to feel, that's not the way I'm going to feel about this. I've got all sorts of other feelings that are coming to the surface. And this feeling that there's an, imp an impossibility to this love, so the, the Jewish leaders themselves felt this and understood it. As they read that Old Testament command, love your neighbor, <laughs> And in that command, in the Old Testament, to love your neighbor was 
the, the reality of loving your enemy, of loving the stranger amongst you. It was, it was part of that command. And, and they sensed that it was impossible, so they added to the law. They, they limited the command, and we see it here. Jesus expresses what they've been saying. He says, you have heard that it was said, verse 43, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Do you see how they've limited it down? They've reduced the number of people to be loved. <laughs> they, they, they've robbed the law of its abundance in terms of who is to be loved. They've made it doable. They've turned it into a law that everybody can keep. And that's what we see. Jesus kind of gives a picture of how the law works itself out in verse 46 and 47. He says, for if you love those who love you, there you go, that's the law being lived out. You love those that love you. Then he says, what reward is that to you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So we see the, the, limit, the limited love being lived out in people's lives. And this twisted law is still lived out today, right now. It, uh, in fact, we would say it's the, the normal, standard law of love that most people go by. We love those who agree with us. We love those who are like us. We hate those who disagree with us. We hate those that are different from us. Surely that's what's being stirred up all the time, more and more in the media and life. But Christians are not to live by that love. We are called to an impossible love, a different love. And God calls us to this impossible love because it really does exist. Because it's the love of God. That's the love that we're considering. The Father, he gives the Son. You remember those famous words in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. He gave him to whom? To his enemies, to be rejected, to be hated, to be brutalized, to be abused, disfigured, and crucified. And the Son came willingly to suffer so that whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do we see the love of God there and what he did for his enemies? And this revelation of love at the cross, which is where we see this impossible love, uh, the more you look at it, the, the, the greater it gets. And, and we see uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus ex expressing that love even deeper on the cross as he prays for his enemies. Uh, Jesus says here in this passage that that's going to be an expression of this impossible love, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a, this is a, this is a peak of this love being shown. Uh, listen to Luke 23 and verse 34 as Jesus is put on the cross. It says, and Jesus was saying. Okay, now, some Bible versions, many Bible versions say, and Jesus said. But equally, the Greek allows it to be, and Jesus was saying, because it's, it's very possible that Jesus said this more than once as they put him on the cross. So Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. As they nail him to the cross, as they go through their act of lifting him up for all to witness his humiliation, his nakedness, his shame, and his suffering, he repeatedly prays for his enemies. Take that in. As the nails are registered in his hands and feet, he prays. What love is revealed to us by Jesus on the cross. You know, it's one of the great heights of love 
to pray for your enemies. And as we do so, we are, as we look at this, we're treading on the mountaintop of love when we do. So do you pray for your enemies? Are you praying right now for those who make your life a misery? Are you praying for their good? <laughs> this is impossible love. I hope you can see that. It's impossible. Not only is this love impossible, it's indiscriminate love. By indiscriminate, we mean without discrimination. God doesn't decide who receives based on who they are. But it's not mindless love. It's not love that's out of control or lacking control. God's indiscriminate love is very purposeful. He determines to give his love to all. So we could say easily also that it's intentional love. Indiscriminate, intentional love. And Jesus gives us a picture of it here, doesn't he, in verses 45 and uh, yeah, in verses 45, he says, So that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So, do you see the picture here? Jesus draws attention to how God shows his universal kindness to all humanity all the time, regardless of who they are. He sends his son. The sunshine, each day it rises. And God would have the power to look at an evil person and hold back the sun. They could live in shadow, but he doesn't. He allows his common kindness and grace to flow to everyone. And the wicked farmer, God doesn't hold back the rain from him so that his land becomes parched. He lets the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. He is indiscriminate in his universal kindness in creation. And Jesus says, that's a picture of his love also. His love comes to people in that indiscriminate way. He doesn't withhold it and the offer of it because they are evil. How God gives the sun and the rain is also how he gives his love. And this is how we are to love too. We're to love this way, indiscriminately, without discrimination, intentionally. We're not to hold back from people. We're to be proactive in our love. We are to move towards People and not away from them, even if they are evil, were to have this tendency. Listen to how Jesus puts it in Matthew, later on in this Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Jesus teaches here, Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, when Jesus says this, He's saying something new. Others have said something similar. It was a common phrase already in the culture that said, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. It sounds familiar, but it's very, very different. One is passive and one is active. One is saying, listen, live by the rule that I won't do to you what I don't want you to do to me. That's very passive. You stay in you where you are and I will be where I am and we'll all be happy. But Jesus doesn't say that. He radically changes it. He says, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. Be proactive in your love towards others. Jesus' teaching moves us towards people, both our friends and our enemies. So imagine you walked into a room full of people. Indiscriminate love moves towards your friend and 
towards your enemy. Now, there will be different interactions. We're not saying that love makes the interactions exactly the same. They could be very different interactions that you have. But the point is that love moves you towards them both. You want their good. You're committed to them. This is impossible love. How are we to love this way? How are you and I to have this love? Well, firstly, we must experience this love. We can't love in this way without experiencing it. We must be saved by this impossible love. If you have not encountered the love of God in Jesus Christ at the cross, that's where you need to go. You need to encounter God's impossible love for you. In Jesus laying down his life, that sinners and enemies of God can be forgiven and made right with him. Imagine with me, if you would, a a lake, and you're standing on the edge of the lake, and there is someone drowning in the lake. The person in the lake that is drowning is a beautiful person, however you might make them beautiful. There they are. To you, they are a beautiful person, and they're drowning. It's not hard for you to imagine that you would want to save them, is it? We like to save beauty. You would want to dive in and rescue that person. But imagine if the person drowning had been pursuing you, chasing you down. They hate you. They want you dead. They're evil. They're full of nastiness. They're wretched. They're horrible, and they're drowning. What then? (laughs) Becomes a bit more complicated. We can see the challenge. Where does the love come to save them? And of course, it becomes complicated because love might not necessarily mean that you will save them. What about if you've got children with you (laughs) who they want to (laughs) kill? Well, then suddenly the motivation of love for others kicks in. You see, love can pull you in a number of different directions. But the point is, what is going to motivate you? Is it love or is it hate? That's the key. No matter which direction you are pulled in, with God... He stood on the bank. And we need to remember, we like to put ourselves in the position of the hero on the bank. You're not, and I'm not the hero. We are the drowning scum. We are the unlovely ones. And God, in his impossible love in Jesus, if your faith is in him today, he rescued you. He saved you. He laid down his life for you. We read about it in Romans chapter 5, didn't we? God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Dear brother and sister, we must never forget we've been been saved by impossible love if we are going to offer impossible love. But secondly, we must receive the power of this love, which is what we do when we believe in Jesus Christ. The moment a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ, the power to live and love with impossible love enters our life because the person of the Holy Spirit enters our life. Again, Romans 5 says this, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He is the oxygen that enables us to climb the mountain that we cannot climb right the way to the top. He is the power we need to love with impossible love. Imagine with me, if you would, a dry riverbed. 
Maybe it's a, a dry riverbed that runs through a pretty dry land at this time. But up from the riverbed, higher up, there's a dam. And behind that dam is a massive, seemingly infinite reservoir. And in that dam wall, there is a gate, a sluice gate. And it is opened. And as it is opened, the water rushes out. It flows out. And it flows out indiscriminately. It, ra- it rushes and races towards rocks that will resist it and reject it. It rushes towards thirsty land that will drink it in and take it. It runs no matter what. It offers itself to all that's in front of it. It bubbles to both. That's how we are to love. Bubbling to both those who resist us and those who receive us. But do remember, the power to flow is from the reservoir, not the river. And your power to love with impossible love always comes from God, not from you. The moment you forget this, the moment we look to ourselves, the river dries up and the flow stops. We become like a bucket, not a sluice gate. And it doesn't take very long to empty a bucket, does it? And the flow doesn't get very far. God is an infinite reservoir of impossible love. And we are a sluice gate through which his love can flow. So remember remember two things at this point, maybe. One, God can flow to all at the same time. You can't. Our indiscriminate love, in one way, must be selective. We're to love all people. So... Love for all people will direct us in different directions at different times. We simply can't love everyone in the same way. It might pull us towards someone and away from someone else for a time. Wanting someone's good doesn't necessarily mean that we always end up coming to them. And there are other things that will shape our love. Legitimate things, justice, wisdom, truth, patience, These kind of things will also shape how our love ultimately looks. But as we've already said, but the point is that it is love that moves us, not hatred and despising. Do you get that? I think that's quite important because as I look inside my life, I often see that it is dislike that is moving my feet, not love. Second thing, loving someone is not the same as liking someone. When we like someone, it normally implies that there's something in them that, that kind of stirs our, our warmth towards them. And we like them because what is inside of them. But remember how we've defined love already. Love is a commitment to someone's good, even when they are unlovely. Do you see the difference? That's important for us to take on board. Because this truth can help us not become confused when we do move towards someone in love, but are finding it hard to like them. So we've thought about impossible love. We've thought about indiscriminate love. Let's think about identifying love. You see, love will identify you, this type of love. When we love with impossible love, by the power of God, people will see, well, two things. The first thing is that we are sons of of God. And the Bible uses that term, Jesus used that term sons because he wants to capture the reality of inheritance, that we are adopted, that we have all that is God's has come to us. In this case, his his perfect love, his impossible love 
has come to us. Because we love in that way, we must be his children. So Jesus isn't saying here, love in this way to become his child, his son. He is saying, when you love in this way, because this love is supernatural and divine and impossible, people will see that you must be a child of God. You must be a son of God. And so he says, doesn't he? Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven so that you will show yourself to be a chip off the block just like your father. You have his love. You must be a child of his Are you looking for assurance in your Christian life that you are a child of God? Do you, do you long for that assurance? God, I long to know that I'm your child. Well, this is one way that that assurance can come to us in a very strong and powerful way. Firstly, identify your enemies, those that really you struggle with. Identify them. Begin praying for them. Pray for their good. Cry out to God to help you love them from his reservoir of impossible love. And then witness as he works in you in them as you draw near to them in love. Take that step. What can be more reassuring to us than seeing God's impossible love at work in us and through us and simply saying, that's not my love. (laughs) I don't love that way. It's come from God. That's what he calls us to. And so as we said, when we love with impossible love by the power of God, God's impossible love is revealed. That's logical, isn't it? That if we love in this way, his love is revealed. And people see it. And when we don't love our enemies, if we refuse to love our enemies, we become just like the world. We've been thinking about a new community in Ephesians. But if we don't love our enemies, we are not displaying a new community. We are conforming to the pattern of this world. In fact, we just become like the Jewish leaders. We twist and limit God's law to make it easy for ourselves. So how are we doing this morning at Hillfields Church Coventry? What love are we displaying? What love are we living by? Are we living by that love we see in verse 46 and 47, where we love those who love us, where our principle to a certain degree is, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back? Is that our principle of love? Or are we able, by God's grace and power, to actually love our enemies and bring glory to God's name. You know, the topic of discrimination will come up fairly regularly, but have we thought and have we been challenged that we may discriminate against the evil person, that we may withhold love from them And do we hate and despise them while loving our friends? That is not a discrimination that God calls us to. This is not an easy path. This is not, this is not me. I don't love in this way. If you know me, you know I don't love in this way. None of us can love in this way. This is impossible love. But it's available because it's real love. And God gives it to us through the person of the Holy Spirit. 
And we are moved by God's love for us to seek to love in this way. And we're called to it. We are not to diminish the law and make it smaller. We're to allow its full abundance to challenge us. So finally, we see it is immaculate love. It is love without fault. It is perfect love. That's what we begin to see in verse 48, isn't it? We see that word. You, therefore... Uh, must be perfect. You see the therefore, God has outlined, Jesus has outlined how God loves, and now he says, you must love in this way. Be perfect, be faultless in it. We haven't got time to go into the fact of how God has already made us faultless in Jesus, how he will make us faultless, and how he is working to make us faultless right now. And we can rejoice in those things, but he calls us to a perfect love, an immaculate love, and that's because that's his love. His love is perfect. His love is immaculate. But what do we think of when we often think of the word perfect? What do we often think? If something or someone is perfect, do we have a negative or a positive view of that? I think we often come with a negative. We immediately think that they're exclusive somehow, that they would rather hold imperfection at a distance. If I'm a perfect model, then I don't want any imperfect models around me. If I'm a perfect student, then please, dummies, stay at a distance. I'm even aware of a dating agency. And uh, to be on this dating agency, you have to send a photo of yourself and a record of your bank balance because they only want the rich and the beautiful. Well, how would you feel applying to that dating agency? It seems quite exclusive. They're searching for what we might call perfectionism. But God is perfect. But what view do you have of your perfect God? Do you have a right view of his perfection? Or when you think of God as perfect, do you feel that you could not come near him? You look at yourself and you are aware of your imperfections. You see them very clearly. You see the lies that you tell. You see the lust that you have. You see the hatred you have for other people. You can identify your selfish ambition and you see all the shadows in your heart. And you say to yourself, why would a perfect God want me anywhere near him? Is that how you feel? This morning, if it is how you are thinking this morning, then I encourage you to radically change the way you view God. His love is perfect, and that means he welcomes you. That's what perfect love does. A room full of perfect, loving people is a very welcoming room to the imperfect. Isn't that amazing? Perfect love isn't exclusive. It is inclusive. It calls imperfect people to come. And God says this morning to you, come, come to me. Maybe you say, don't I have to get clean first? Don't I have to get rid of all these imperfections? Do you know what God says? He says, I've provided a bath to be washed in. That bath is the cross. You can be washed of all your imperfections. You can be cleansed of all your sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, the life that he gave up on the cross as a sacrifice, cleanses people. And you can come to him today and be clean. He wants you to come. He calls you to come. He wants you to enjoy his love. You can step into the love of God today, into his cleansing power. You can know his impossible love. Maybe you're a Christian right now in this room, listening online. Have you dark thoughts about your God? Have you been doubting his love? 
Have you misunderstood what it means for your God to perfectly love you? To love you with an unfailing, never-ending love. To always work for your good. To draw near to you in spite of your imperfections. And to love you completely. Have you got that picture of your God? That's who he is. So don't avoid him. Come to him. Rejoice in his impossible love for you. Spend time in the presence of that love. In total security. That imperfect as you are on a daily basis, he loves you. And he has cleansed you in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.